I was the officer in charge of optical instrumentation at Vandenberg Air Force Base in the 1369th Photo Squadron. And as such, it was my duty to supervise the instrumentation photography of every missile that went down the Western Test Range. In those days, we called them ICBMs, inter-county ballistic missiles, because most of them blew up on launch. And our job was to determine why they blew up, to provide the engineers uh, good enough engineering sequential photography so that they could see what was wrong with, with the bird as it took off in flight. What we photographed up there affected me for the rest of my life and made a huge impact on my understanding of the universe and of governmental manipulation of, of our minds. The uh, purpose of them was they were ballistic missiles. They were to deliver nuclear weapons on targets. That's what they were what they were there for. We weren't launching real nuclear weapons, we were launching dummy warheads. They were the exact size, shape, and dimension and weight of a nuclear warhead. For my stunning achievement in finding a place where I could look back at Vandenberg Air Force Base from up north and for figuring out how to transmit the timing up there and for getting the, 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 the thing set up, I was awarded the Air Force Guided Missile Insignia. I was the first photographic officer in the Air Force to get the, they called it the missile badge. And it was highly coveted uh, thing at the time. It was definitely in 1964 because uh, Florence Mansman confirmed that and he knew. He had written it down and, and knew the exact date of it. They counted down the missile. We heard engine ignition, lift off. We knew the missile was underway. And we were looking down south, um, southwest, and the missile popped up through the fog. It was just beautiful. And I hollered, there it is. And our guys on our M45 tracking mount with 180 inch lenses on it got it. And the big BU telescope swung over and got it. And we followed the thing. And sure enough, we could see all three stages of powered flight as they burned out and dropped away. And then, of course, to our naked eye, all we saw was a smoke trail going off into subspace as it headed off toward its target, which was Annie Weetok Island, Annie Weetok Atoll. So we whoopied and shouted and heard the film wrap off in, the, in the, the, the BU telescope and figured, well, that was our first big deal and we got it. We sent the film back down to, to, to Vandenberg and uh, I don't know exactly how long it was after the, 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 the event. It might have been a day or two. I was called into Major, Major Mansman's office at the 1st Strategic Aerospace Division headquarters. And I walked into his office and they had a, a screen and a 16 millimeter projector set up. There was a couch um, and Major Mansman said sit down and there were two guys, as I recall, two guys in gray suits, civilian clothes, which was fairly unusual. Um, and uh, Major Mansman said watch this and turned on the film projector and I watched the screen and there was the launch from the day or two before at, at, uh, at Big Sur. It was quite exciting because of the length of the, of the telescope, as the Atlas missile entered the frame, we could see the, the whole third stage, which, is, which has two uh, rocket nozzles like this and one in the center, a gimbaled one in the center, filling our frame from 100 and, oh, about 160 miles. That was pretty exciting optics. We watched that stage burn out. We watched the second stage burn out. We watched the third stage burn out. And into the frame came something else. It flew into the frame like this, and it shot a beam of light at the warhead, which is represented by my thumb here. Now, remember, all this stuff is flying at several thousand miles an hour. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, and then this thing flies up like this. Meanwhile, we're all going like this, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, we're going like this, fires another beam of light, goes down like this, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead, tumbles out of the outer space. Now I saw that. I don't give a goddamn what anybody else says about it. I saw that on film. Phil Klass can kiss my ass. He wasn't there. I was. Now when the lights came on, Major Mansman turned around and looked at me and said, were you guys screwing around up there? And I said, no sir. And he said, what was that? And I said, it looks to me like we got a UFO. Now, the thing that we saw, this object that flew in, was circular, was shaped like a two saucers cupped like this with a ping pong ball on top. 
and the beam of light came out of the ping pong ball. That's what I saw on film. Now, Major Mansman said to me, after some discussion about it, and a, he said, you are never to speak of this again. As far as you're concerned, this never happened. And I said, well, and he said, I don't need to, to emphasize the, the, the dire consequences of a security breach, do I? And I said, no, sir. And he said, fine, this never happened. And so I started for the door. He said, wait a minute. He said, years from now, if you're ever forced by someone to talk about this, you are to tell them it was laser strikes, laser tracking strikes. Well, in 1964, we didn't have any laser tracking strikes. We didn't have any laser tracking at all. Lasers were in, in their infancy in 1964. They were little playthings in laboratories. So I said, yes, sir, and walked out, and that was the last I talked about it for 18 years. I didn't talk about it to anybody at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Nobody in my squadron knew about it. Nobody saw the film but me. My commanding officer, Major Lewis S. Clement, Jr., didn't see it. My operations officer, Captain Kenneth R. Callahan, didn't see it. His assistant, Lieutenant Ronald O. Baylor, didn't see it. Their uh, assistant, Chief Warrant Officer Guy M. Spooner, didn't see it. Nobody in my squadron saw it, and I didn't talk about it to anybody under direct orders from Major Florence J. Mansman, Jr. Consequently, no one at Vandenberg that I know of knows anything about this. That sounds real suspicious, doesn't it? Somebody should have seen it. Somebody should have talked about it. Well, they didn't, because in those days, I didn't talk about top secret things that, that, that I was told not to talk about. There are things that I know about that I did in the service that I won't talk about to you now because they're top secret and I could get my ass in trouble for talking about them. After 18 years, it occurred to me that I could talk about this one incident because nobody ever told me it was classified top secret. If you parse what Major Mansman said, he said, you are to say this never happened. Well, that's not classifying it top secret, is it? Didn't happen to anybody else. It's not a secondhand story. This happened to me. And I was a part of a United States Air Force cover up for 18 years. The object, the points of light that we saw, the warhead and so forth, were traveling through subspace about 60 miles straight up. Uh, and they were going somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 to 14,000 miles an hour when this thing caught up to them, flew in, flew around them, went like this, and flew back out. Everything was going about between 11 and 14,000 miles an hour that way. It was saucer shaped, it was circular and rounded on the top and bottom, and it had a little dome in the, in, 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 right straight in the center of it from which this beam emitted. After that article hit, the shit hit the fan. I started being harassed at work. I started by odd telephone calls that would come during the day. At night at my house, uh, I would get telephone calls all night long, sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, midnight, 10 o'clock. Uh, people would call and start screaming at me. You're going down, motherfucker! You're going down, motherfucker! And that's all they'd say, and they'd keep screaming that until I finally hung up the phone. One night, somebody blew up my mailbox by putting a big load of, of skyrockets in it. The mailbox went up in flames, and that night at 1 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. I picked it up, and somebody said, skyrockets in your box at night. Oh, what a beautiful sight, motherfucker. And things like that have happened on and off for since 1982. Uh, I told you that uh, since this History Channel thing came up and since you've started asking questions and obviously this, this thing is in the wind again, I'm starting to get telephone calls again. My wife and I get phone calls out here in nowhere, Illinois, where we've, we've retreated out to our farm. And what have some of the recent calls been? What have they been they saying? They don't say anything. They simply, you pick up the phone and say, hello, hello, and there's a mm, click. It's disconcerting, yeah. but I've learned to not give a flip. I just don't care anymore. What are they going to do, kill me? What are they going to do, discredit me? 
Are, are they going to do any more than Philip Class has already done to me? Are they going to make me look foolish? That's about all they can do. I, I believe, it's a, a, a belief system of mine that, that, that this nutty fringe around UFOs is part of the, 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 the sort of concerted effort to keep serious study of it down. Anytime anybody tries to, 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 to study this subject seriously, we're subject to ridicule. Um, I'm a full professor at a, at a relatively major university, and I'm certain that my colleagues at the university laugh at me and, and hoot and holler behind my back when they hear that I have an interest in studying uh, unidentified flying objects. And uh, that's just one of the things that we have to live with. So was I in the Air Force? The Air Force denied it. Was I ever at Vandenberg? Well, of course I couldn't because I wasn't in the Air Force. How could I have been at Vandenberg? Did I put a tracking site at Big Sur, California? No, there was no tracking site at Big Sur, California, which is a crock. The tracking site at Big Sur, California is still there right where I put it, and they use it to show you every time the, the, the space shuttle lands in California, that's where you first see it from. And they're still photographing missiles from Vandenberg from that tracking site. At any rate, uh, to corroborate my story, Lee Graham tracked down Florence J. Mansman Jr., the same major who had ordered me to shut up about it. He was now a PhD uh, uh, from Stanford in nuclear physics, I think. I'm not sure what his, what his background was, but it was, it was a PhD from, from Stanford uh, and a rancher in Fresno, California. And he wrote to Lee back saying, everything Bob said in his story is absolutely true. He corroborated my story. And he continued to do that year after year. Every time somebody brought it up, every time somebody would contact him, he corroborated my story by saying, yes, that's exactly what happened. It takes a lot of guts to do that. I became a fan of Sonny's. He's, a, he's now deceased. He was my hero for a while. I wasn't in the room at the time, but what happened to the film is an interesting story in itself, uh, as Major Mansman told me and other people. Uh, sometime after I had gone, the guys in civilian clothes, and he said there were three of them. I remembered two. He said there were three people from this agency, and I thought it was the CIA. Uh, he said, no, it wasn't the CIA, it was somebody else, and I never did find out who it was. He said, what happened is this. They took the film, and they spooled off the part that had the UFO on it, and they took a pair of scissors and cut it off. They put that on a separate reel, they put it in their briefcase, they handed Major Mansman back the rest of the film and said, here, I don't need to remind you, Major Mansman, of the, of the uh, severity of a security breach. We'll consider this uh, incident closed and they walked off with the film. Major Mansman never saw it again, and as far as I'm concerned, or nobody else ever saw it again, certainly not at Vandenberg. I'm certain that it left Vandenberg and went somewhere else. Major Mansman, who was a, a, a very good um, reader of film, said that the feeling at the time was that it must have been extraterrestrial that they assumed that the, the beam of light that struck the warhead, the dummy warhead, was some sort of plasma beam, because it looked like a plasma beam. And they were assuming that it was something like that. Major Florence J. Mansman was a man of great honor and great scientific standing in, 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 the, in the community. For him to corroborate it is good enough for me. Even if I didn't believe myself, I would believe Major Mansman. Now there were, there were two of us who were Air Force officers at the time, and we saw something, and we have both corroborated with each other that we saw that, that that's what we, we recall from, from the incident. And what I have to ask skeptics, or people who disbelieve what I'm saying is, why would I make this up? Why would Major Florence J. Mansman, Dr. Major J. Florence J. Mansman, why would he make it up? Why, what, what have we to gain? I've made no money from this. I've got nothing but pain and suffering out of it, out of talking about it. I've been harassed at my home. Uh, this was used against me partially in losing a job once in teaching. I've had a hell of a time after I've told this story, but I continue to tell the story because I think it's important for people to understand that this sort of shit goes on in the government that the government covers up information that we are entitled to know about as citizens of this country. That's why I tell my story. That's why I'm telling it to you. And I'll continue to tell it as long as I'm alive. 
And I'll always tell it the same way because it only happened one way. I never vary the story because I can't. It's the truth. And I've been the subject of humiliating letters and phone calls from, from skeptics like James Oberg at NASA and Philip J. Class, who's an idiot, a paid informant of the United States government, uh, who persist in, in belittling me. And that's fine if they want to belittle, belittle me. But don't belittle Sonny Mansman. The things that were denied specifically, first of all, was that I was ever in the Air Force. They had no record of me. I was at Vandenberg. No, they had no record of that. Once we found, oh, he was at Vandenberg. Well, he was never at Big Sur because we don't have a tracking site at Big Sur. Well, we proved that. Um, that that's the nature of, of, of bureaucratic idiocy. The Air Force's position right now is there was no such incident and there was no film of it. The thing that's important to me about this whole operation is very simply the biggest event in the history of humankind is the discovery that we are not alone. That there are other living entities, intelligent entities, in this universe or other universes and that we aren't here alone. That's a huge, enormous discovery. It's the discovery of the of the, of, of the lifetime of humankind, isn't it? To find out that we're not here alone. That's why I think it's important to talk about these things. I think that's exciting. And I think that it's important for us as, as, as humans to, to, to come to term, to grow up, uh, Arthur C. Clarke's childhood's end, to grow up and recognize that we may not be the paragon of animals after all that there may be something out there that's bigger and more exciting than we are, and that just maybe, just maybe, they're telling us something. Now, what I saw that day was something shooting down a dummy nuclear warhead. What message would I interpret from that? Don't mess with nuclear warheads. That's probably the message I would interpret from, from that. I'd say, oh, well, maybe somebody doesn't want us annihilating Moscow. Maybe we should stop doing that. I'm not sure that's, that, that's what went on. But Ronald Reagan one night went on television and did the most astonishing thing. Most astonishing. He stood up in front of America and said, we're going to build a defensive shield. We're going to call it SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And its mission is going to be to protect us, to protect all of us. He said, Ronald Reagan said, we're going to share this with everybody. We're going to share it with the Russians, ooh, our enemies, the guys that only a few years ago we were throwing, we were pretending to, to annihilate. Oh, suddenly we're going to protect them with a shield. From whom are we going to protect them? I just find some interesting patterns in, in, in life, and that's one of the patterns that I thought might be important. That perhaps that was the first shot across the bow. Uh, first warning shot from somebody saying knock this off kid it's time to grow up you don't want to annihilate this planet do you could be my take on what happened there is based on not only my own speculation but having read other things and talked to other people over the intervening years that maybe the whole thing had something to do with a preview of the strategic defense initiative for star wars it's another possibility i suppose if you if you agree that perhaps our paranoia is unfounded, and if we encounter beings with superior technologies, maybe we should embrace them and be nice to them because they might be showing us how to survive. Something turned those missiles off, and so they could not be put in a mode of launching. When I was a commander of a radar squadron up in Maine at Caswell Air Force Station, Maine, we were right next door to Loring Air Force Base, was where they launched the B-52s and the, the KC tankers and things like that. <clears throat> I had a lot of security friends over there at Loring who told me about